What's the word, y'all? When I look at the Eastern Conference, I see it in a couple different tiers. Tier number one is going to have the Boston Celtics by themselves when you dominate the Eastern Conference by 14 games and then dominate your way to the finals. You deserve to be in a tier by yourself. And then in the second tier, I see teams like the Bucks, the 76ers, the Knicks. And then tier number three is where things get really, really interesting to me because I have teams like the Cavs and the Miami Heat, who I've already made videos about, the Indiana Pacers, and then the subject of today's video, the Orlando Magic. Because if you're counting on your fingers, you're doing some mathematics, that's seven, that's seven teams. That's seven teams. One of those teams will be a playing team. And being a playing team is not a death sentence. Let's be honest with each other. The playing has allevi uh, has elevated the seven and eight seed to the real series a lot of the times, right? But, but still, like think about those seven teams and how much momentum all seven of those teams, all of those teams' fan bases will tell you we should be a top four seed this season. Let's forget about tier number one and tier number two. You understand that. If you're a Pacers fan, you're thinking, we just made it to the conference finals. We brought everybody back and we got another offseason of Pascal Siakam. We should be a top four seed. If you're an Orlando Magic fan, we were just a five seed and we should be a year older and a year better. And we brought in KCP. We should be a four seed. The Miami Heat are going to say that we're we going to be healthy this season. Last time we were healthy, we were the one seed. And the Cavs said, hell, we've been a four seed for the last couple years somebody's going to be disappointed. And I keep thinking about of these seven teams, at least of the four teams that I have in tier number three, who's going to be the team that's going to be disappointed? And I, I don't really know, but we're going to talk about it. But I do want to start off with the with the Orlando Magic because um, I did an appearance on a podcast named The Six Man Show. Shout out to the guys. They're an Orlando, Ma Orlando Magic specific pod. If you don't know them, go check it out. And on that, uh, before last season started, I made a joke like, next time we talk to each other, we're going to be talking about the Orlando Magic versus the Bulls in the play-in. And we were like, ha, 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 ha. Good joke, Kenny. You funny. That, that team didn't make the play-in. They were the five seed. They exceeded expectations. Now, yes, if you look at the standings, they had the exact same record as a play-in team, but they had the tiebreaker, which made them a five seed regardless. They exceeded all of our expectations. And all of us were very boisterous about the team. Hell, they have an entire show about them. Of course, they were going to be biased and say we're going to be great. And their greatness to them was making the plan. And they got a full seven-game series that went down to the wires. Game seven. And, um, yeah, they, they, they had a great year. And I think what's the best thing about the Orlando Magic is that last year they were the fourth youngest team in basketball, at least going into the year. Um, and if you look at these top seven teams, and the only reason I'm going seven is because the Pacers – are 25.1. 25.1 is basically a granddad in the NBA. The seven youngest teams of basketball, at least last season. There are only two of them that we can actively say have an identity. We have the OKC Thunder, as you know, one of the best teams in hoops, and then the Orlando Magic. And for them to be this young and with a first-time coach, not a first-year coach, but a first-time head coach, for them to have an identity this early on just sets them up so much better. Because some of these other teams are drafting to find the players to build an identity to build a culture and the orlando magic have been able to draft guys to come in and accept that the culture is we're gonna play defense this is the second best defense in basketball only behind a rudy gobert led defense that's insane the second best defense in basketball simultaneously is the fourth youngest teams in hoops makes no sense and i think about next season I don't know if they're going to be the second best defensive team in basketball, but there's nothing about their defense that I feel like won't translate over. You know, sometimes teams get a hot defensive streak where they're allowing a lot of corner three-point shots and they're wide open, but their opponent just misses them. Sometimes you get luck. There's nothing about the Orlando Magic advanced stats defensively that make me think that what they just did last year was luck. They should be not just a good defense next season, a great defense again. What changes them from potentially being that seventh seed or being that fourth seed is the offense. The Orlando Magic have not had a good offense as long as I've been an adult. <laughs> Let me go check when was the last time the Orlando Magic had a good offense. And I mean for a full season. Don't give me a month of sample size. I mean for a full damn season. Here's the last time the Orlando Magic had a top 10 offense. 2009. <laughs> What the heck? 2009, 2010. But let's just say we need them to be average. The last time they had an average offense was 2012. Dog, 2012, Braun was in Miami. That's how long it's been since the Orlando Magic have had at least a top 15 offense in basketball. Kind of crazy to just click through this and see 20s every single year, bro. 29th. Oh, my God. 30th. Oh, my God. Dead last. 26th. And then last year, hey, 22nd is a lot better than 30th. Um, and again, they won 47 games while being the 27th ranked uh, defense be or offense because they were the second best defense in, in hoops. And listen, I don't, I don't ask them to be top 10. I just wanted to see what, what the last year was for that. If they could go, go to be in top 15, that opens up the ceiling of this team by a large margin. So Kenny, how do they get there? Well, they, they made one point by going out to get KCP and they had a uh, wiggle room to go get 
a lot more. From my understanding, they did call for Paul George. Paul George wasn't really interested. And this is one of those off seasons where it's like, if it ain't a star, then we're okay with just going to get a, a really solid role player that can help us get our three-point volume up. I um, mean, that's KCP. Or I guess KCP's volume is a little bit over, overstated. I think it's his consistency from three that, that matters. But regardless, adding another shooter to the team actually should help. A lot of this is dependent on, on two players offensively. Player number one is ahead of the stake, Paolo Bencaro, who just had such a ridiculous second season where you watch him in the playoffs last year and they threw every single look you could throw at him. Doubles, um, uh, late late doubles, early doubles, just, just making it so very difficult. Sometimes they ran a guy like Jalen Suggs off the line, but for the most part, they were letting people shoot anybody but Paolo. And he still walked into that series and averaged, what, 27 points per game and shot 40% from three. And he was just a man out there. And I remember watching this series, bro. And I remember if it was game five or game six, one of those games, I'm like Googling Paolo Bancaro just to make sure that I remember him only being 21 years old. And he is. He's only 21 years old. And you can miss me when you talk about efficiency for a 21-year-old. You can miss me when you talk about the turnovers in that series. None of that shit is really irrelevant to, uh, really relevant to me because, A, his spacing was absolutely awful last season. So I didn't expect his efficiency to be really high. And again, he's 21 years old. If we're talking about the efficiency of a 21-year-old, I think we need to go back to the drawing board. But the, the, the turnovers in that postseason, again, like I said, they defended him. Go watch that series again. Just one of the games. Randomly select and watch how difficult they made it for Paolo. And that score was on top of things. So I'm not really overreacting to some of those things. Now, if he's in year number seven, his efficiency hasn't changed, then we can have a conversation. Hell, even if it's year number five, year number four, but going into year number two, his first playoff series, miss me when you talk efficiency. Either way, we, we do want Paolo Bencaro to take that next step. And that's saying a lot because he already just took that all-star jump. And I don't think it's too, I guess, crazy to ask him or to expect him to be better next season. Take another jump. Because not only is he tasked with being the number one scorer on this team, he's also tasked with being like the, like him and him and Franz both have similar roles as far as sometimes they are the initiator of the offense and play this point four role. Um, and they're going to rely on that heavily because they they didn't go out there and go get a point guard, which is one of the things I wanted them to do. Especially if you have some of the dudes, some of those very head steady point guard signed for minimums. They didn't get one. That's completely okay. They're relying on Jalen Suggs to be able to initiate a little bit more on offense too. But they're they're gonna need one of those guys to take that big playmaking jump. And I do want to say Paolo and Franz are both really good playmakers specifically for their position last year. But I think if they want to hit that next level offensively, they need to be, be better, take another jump there. So Jamal Mosey was asked about how much the increase in Jalen Suggs' game will be on the ball. He said there's going to be a significant amount. Um, he's going to be able to have the ability to control the game, control the pace, settle us down. He's done, done such a tremendous job this summer working on his game, his spirit, his energy, his body of work, and what he needs to do. They all, He also said in this one, like, we're in a very unique spot that we're not building conventionally where we're going to play through the 6'10 uh, forwards. So Jalen Suggs will be the point guard. But again, you have to recognize that that um, Franz Wagner and Paolo Bencaro are going to initiate offense all the time. And with Jalen Suggs having this increased role, there are two major questions behind it. It's A, can he somehow turn away from the, the nonsensical turnovers that you get from him here or there? Because it's been about two years since he's been a full-time point guard. Like, of course, he's done it in spot minutes here or there. But for the most part, he's transitioned his way into an off guard. And now that you have Kenny Pope there, it's going to be him, Kenny Pope, Wagner, Paolo Bencaro, and Wendell Carter will be my expectations so you need him to be a low turnover guy and you also need him to be able to translate that three-point shooting from last year into this year and I'm, I'm pretty optimistic about it so I saw the study five days ago and shout out to the to the writer here I'll put the link in the description where they were basically looking at the data behind Jalen Suggs and shooting and as you can see this is a very easy graph to read his rookie season these were his three-point attempts when it comes to uh, pull up and then you got the catch and shoot as you can see we're talking 20s percents it's ugly. Your number two gets a little bit better. He's mid thirties, which is about league average on catch and shoot, or I guess three point percentage in general. He's still not great on pull up. And the year number three is where it exploded, where he was a 40% catch and shoot shooter and maybe 38, 39% um, pull up jump shooter, which is incredible. Could he be able to translate this? And sometimes we do see players have a really good season from shooting the ball. And then that's all we really get. But also in this data, um, he decided, and I thought this was very interesting, and I kind of want to do this for other players across the association, 
where they tried to see whether there were underlying factors contributing contributing to his shooting growth and to see if there was, was broader improvements in his game that he was missing. And basically what he decided to do is take a look at Jalen Suggs' three-point shooting and his touch at the basket. And I don't have the science to prove it, but I feel as though if you are going to become a better three-point shooter and it's going to be translatable, you also should have an extra touch around the rim. And basically the study says, yeah. He was a, his touch around the rim was best it ever was in his career as well. So that makes me feel like what he did last year as far as a shooter goes is translatable because it seems like overall he's increased his touch. And that is super important. I think the Orlando Magic right now are in a place that the OKC Thunder were last year where we eventually saw the OKC Thunder go from a team that was trying to develop talent to a team that was trying to win or do, do like a balance of both where we saw games where Josh Giddy, who was looked at to be a part of the core, was sitting out fourth quarters and closing games because they really prioritized winning. And I think this young Orlando Magic team are going to be in the very similar spot where like you do have players like Anthony Black, Jet Howard, who they just drafted last year, who you want to see get big time minutes to grow as players. But they also have the expectations of not just making the playoffs, but winning in the playoffs. So you might see a guy that you're invested in as a young guy not really get as many opportunities as he previously did. Because this is their depth chart. Like I mentioned, this is their projected starting five. Then they do have Cole Anthony, who could be a spark off the bench. Gary Harris is here. And Lord knows in the playoffs, Gary Harris was bad on both sides of the floor. Hopefully he can get back to being a decent version of himself. They have Anthony Black as a backup three. I'm interested to see if that's what it looks like. Jonathan Isaac and Mo Wagner. This is one of those disgusting hated teams. And again, I mean that as a compliment. They beat you up. They foul a bunch. Um, they going, I was about to say some crazy. I'll take it down your throat. Uh, this team gets a lot of shots at the basket. They miss a lot of shots at the basket. They get their own rebounds and they go back up. Like this team is a nasty, nasty team as a compliment. And one thing I'm so very interested in, this will be where I end the video because I think the most important thing about the Orlando Magic is that Jonathan Isaac gained 30 pounds this off season. Minute for minute, he's one of the three most impactful defensive players. And now you're telling me that he's bulked up a little bit more where he can run some five, man. Like he ran five last year, don't get me wrong, but he can really, really run some five. We talk about their defense last year. Gosh, man, I can't even tell you. I can't even, I can't even tell you, bro. If you've been around this channel for some time, I've been a John Isaac believer, especially defensively. So if he's coming in healthy and he's got this extra muscle, I don't know what to tell you. Y'all better watch out.